Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the world's greatest investing podcast. My view now is that ASTS is actually an AI at the edge company. My first impression of it was that this was actually a company that was positioned to print billions of dollars of free cash flow overnight as soon as they instantiated their satellite constellation because they actually save MNOs, mobile network operators, a lot of money, and they deliver value to end customers that the industry hasn't done so yet. That is true. But now I believe that this, the, actual, the actual opportunity is much bigger. While at the beginning, that was kind of a hypothesis, which I didn't take too seriously. Now I do. Because as they acquire different types of spectrum, like um, L-Band with the acquisition of Legato, what they're going to do is be able to print. It's, this is basically going to be the machine that prints personalized spectrum at a marginal cost in a way that's increasingly harder to emulate while operating a viable business. So it's exactly the same blueprint as Iron for data centers, Rocket Lab for rockets that then print constellations, Rivian for cars as well, unpopular opinion, but it's true, it is happening. Uh, Absolera for improved patient outcomes uh, by essentially synthesizing any molecule of any shape that performs any function inside the body that we desire. These guys are moving down that direction because if you want to operate a swarm of end devices, be it as an MNO, lots of cell uh, phones, or as maybe uh, you know a company that powers humanoid robots like Tesla is going to be a few years from now and stuff, you're going to really want to optimize the kind of spectrum you're using. Each spectrum has a frequency which has different properties and ultimately delivers to value to customers in different ways and at a different cost. So you just don't want to be using the wrong type of spectrum. And therefore, if you have a platform that delivers the spectrum you need to thousands, millions, billions of devices at a cost that really no one else can match and in a very convenient way, so you don't have to switch platforms, then you're going to stick with that provider. That's essentially what ASTS is becoming. Now they are allegedly on track to print um, six block two satellites per month. And the management says they're going to achieve that before the end of 2025, which I think is going to be very interesting to see. Now they reiterate, and it's fairly clear to me that they only need like 25 satellites to provide non-continuous coverage and up to 90 to provide continuous coverage worldwide. So there's a bunch of competitive dynamics that I analyzed in the past, like does it matter that ASTS doesn't have a vertically integrated launch capacity? Actually, CapEx went up quite a bit this quarter, as you will see in the written form of the update. Much of that was driven by having to prepay a launch provider. So not having integrated launch capacity, I think, is weighing on ASTS's financials in the short term. However, if you look the direction that the platform is going in is one, satellites are larger, two, they have more spectrum. So eventually, and this is already true, with Block 2, I think they are positioned to abstract away the leverage that launch providers currently have over them. Because with Block 2, you need just 90 satellites to provide worldwide continuous coverage. Maybe with Block N, say Block 7, they just need two satellites. So then that sort of um, competitive advantage that other players do have at the moment does get eroded. I think it's fairly likely. Now, the one metric that I'm looking at which I think is the most telling in the thesis, the top KPI is gateway bookings, which is the money that MNO spend to deploy the infrastructure that's essential, sorry, essential to integrate ASTS Space Mobile's network with terrestrial cellular infrastructure. This number, gateway bookings, is up from $13.6 million in Q1 2025 to $14.9 million this quarter, Q2 2025. Now, Q1 2025 is the first time we saw this metric emerge. And with this, uh, with this growth quarter over quarter, I think what we can see is MNOs being increasingly bullish on ASTS's infrastructure. So I've seen, generally, I believe these guys have quite tremendous process power. I'm going to talk about some uh, wide-reaching conclusions towards the end of the video, how I'm starting to think about venture capital-like investments in the public markets. But basically, these guys have tremendous process power so whatever they do, whatever they say they do, they end up doing. So I take what they say quite seriously. And so you have Abel Avellan, the CEO, saying they're going through this inflection point. They are on path, on, on a path to achieve a six-month satellite production cadence by the end of 2025. Launches, I think, will ensue. And that's not something we really have to put into question because the launch capabilities are out there in the market. You just have to pay for them. They don't have to develop them. So actually... I think that per the evolution of gateway bookings, per what management is saying and stuff, 
I think it's it's really quite likely that these guys are about to go through quite a meaningful inflection process, say over the next year, year and a half, tentatively. So I quite like uh, the setup here. So the other thing that I wanted to talk about is um, the moat broadly. At the moment, I'm not entirely clear on how difficult it is to replicate ASTS's faced um, faced array tech, which is basically what enables them to beam the same spectrum to many devices at the same time. It's the primary enabler of the platform. However, it's it's looking to me increasingly like the combination of you know the various components of the stack that go into the moat. It's getting harder every quarter to replicate. So as I was saying, as you have more spectrum types, firstly, you have to get the whole face array thing right. Then you have to deploy the spectrums. But in order to do that, you have to be navigating all this regulatory environment. Then you have to get all the partnerships with the MNOs right. And and maybe it's someone else when we're talking about physical AI slash AI at the edge. So it's a whole stack that gets harder to replicate at a given level of cost efficiency as the satellites get larger, right? Because one thing is to emulate face array tech at the block one level. Another thing is to do it at the block two level. And then say a few years from now, it's gonna be much harder to do so at the block six level, for example. So although I'm not clear on the face array tech because I'm not an expert in that technology, um, I am increasingly bullish on the nature of the moats. So I actually quite like this. And then as I was saying, my view of the TAM is has actually evolved quite po quite positively over the past year and stuff. And I've now come to understand that this is more of an AI at the edge play than anything. And although that market isn't here yet, I think it's going to be here quite quickly. Now, as I said, I want to talk about something which is understanding process power when you're looking at sort of early stage companies of this sort in the public markets. One observation that I have, and it's it's longitudinal, and it's relevant to ASTS, Iron, Absolera, Rivian, uh, HelloFresh to some extent too, is that when you have a company that's doing something that's quite apparently impossible and has exhibited extraordinary process power to date, it's sort of a reasonable bet to make that the company is going to be in a better position a year later down the line. These companies financially have two things in common. Although they're not yet cash, machine, uh, cash machines, excuse me, they do not lose as much cash as any other company would faced with such an impossible task. So if you look at the graph of cash from operations for all of these companies that I just mentioned, it's actually quite striking how they're not losing $500 million per quarter or something with the investments they're making and how difficult it is. So they, they, they have this um, negative cash from operations that's a little bit in sort of homeostasis. It's in a kind of balance. And it's positioned for when they fine tune their machine enough to print a highly valuable asset that there's infinite demand for on the other side of the equation, then they print cash such that increments in the top line would be highly accretive to the bottom line. That's the first thing they have in common financially. Secondly, their balance sheet is actually in a relatively good state. This is particularly true for Absolera and this company, ASTS. It's if any other management team on the planet that would be doing the same thing these guys are doing would be bleeding cash like crazy and have a very, very bad balance sheet. Kind of like what happened with Amaris where I lost 100% of my capital. So my experience here by studying these companies longitudinally is building up. And I think I'm developing a little bit of a framework. It's really just an extension of my current framework that applies to earlier stage companies. Now, I, I wouldn't be able to make a bet on any of these companies specifically, highly concentrated, large bet, like I do with uh, the companies in my portfolio now, like say $500,000. But I could spray something like 200,000, 300,000 among these companies because I believe that the odds of one or two of these companies from this basket that I mentioned, so ASTS, Iron, Absolera, Rocket Lab, et cetera, succeeding are now actually much higher. So actually, as I was saying, if you go back one year in time, you're going to see the extraordinary process power has culminated into these companies now being positioned to go through an inflection point. So they're getting really good at essentially operating this machine, which prints stuff, which is very valuable. And I think that the odds of one of these succeeding is high. The, all of them are pointing at infinite terms. And so if any one of them gets this right, a portfolio that's evenly spread out between each of these bets, I think is likely to do quite well. So I may actually be tackling this in this manner. It's, as I was saying, an extension of my current framework to more 
towards more of a venture capital side of the spectrum. So at the moment, what I do is VC in the public markets with positive cash from operations. I think this is a way in which I could move into the more uh, venture capital like side of the spectrum. So that's it for today. Uh, going forward, I'm going to continue watching the gateway bookings. I am going to continue trying to understand the face of Ray tech better. But just by studying this company over time, I think at some point, if it's not with ASTS, it's going to be with any other of these companies. There's going to come a point where the opportunity is quite clear. There's cash from operations and maybe the market is pessimistic with any one of these companies. And then maybe uh, perhaps that is an attempt of mine to time the market, right? I'm just thinking out loud here. But generally, I think the basket approach is going to work uh, so long as each of these companies continues exhibiting extraordinary process power, which for now, I think is very much the case, definitely with ASTS. So guys, thank you very much for joining me today. As always, if you enjoyed this video, could you share this update with someone else? My deep dives and updates are for free. And so the only way this goes is with your help. If you want to access the written form of the, dub, uh, of the update, that's available in my blog for free as always, together with all of the updates and the deep dives. So thank you very much in advance. Take care and see you next time.